Hello, everybody, and welcome back to You Can't Win. This is Tom here, and I'm joined by Don, as usual. We also have returning guest Ed Buck back today. Uh, we're going to be talking about movies and film criticism in particular. Uh, that's been something of a bugaboo for old Ed Buck for a while. Uh, he's been kind of bombing the Discord with all his favorite letterboxed reviews and stuff. So we're going to see uh, what's bugging him about these things so much and maybe figure out what's the deal with movie reviews. Hey, yo. So uh, I kind of wanted to begin with like a, a personal observation. I think that's how you're supposed to begin like a good, like creative nonfiction is that you don't, you know, you don't just quote something or you don't try to be like cute or funny. You just try to sound relatable. And what I find kind of about movie reviews is that I find it very physically unpleasant to be around people that I don't like or don't agree with. I find that like there's like a physical reaction um, of like repulsion to people who have like very different opinions, very different viewpoints to mine. And it's like physically hard to kind of hang around with people who are like just have like a completely opposite view of everything. And I just find like I don't like the term and I put like as many scare quotes as possible, but the term like bodily affect uh that kind of language i find is appropriate for that because um whenever i read something that i really dislike and i really just have no interest in it's it's very it's very off-putting and um i feel like the internet and especially twitter is about like doing that to yourself over and over and over again uh and i've been doing that to myself over and over again i think like letterboxd uh, more than twitter even is is like is about that is this you just put yourself through the company of people that you hate on a very physical level <laughs> okay yeah and um, uh, so you have an example of one of these sure, things yeah. that caused uh total uh, body horror or whatever well, well i don't want to spoil the reaction but <laughs> why yes don i have an example and <laughs> The example, I have a couple of reviews, actually. I wanted to read one from, uh, there's one from Jonathan Rosenbaum, and it's about uh, jean de Godard's History of Cinema. And the quote there is that, um, philosophically speaking, History of Cinema is a dangerous work because it dares to raise the issue for whom cinema, film criticism, and film history belong to. Truthfully, they belong to everyone today with a VCR, but contractually, they belong to the state, and the state today, especially from the point of an American like myself, is Disney. It is Disney and its client states such as Miramax that set our cultural agendas and rewrite our official film histories and critiques via the mass media. So that's the first quote. Um, no kind of reaction to that. Well, yeah. it, it kind of made me dizzy. Like it just turns to mush when I'm listening to that. It's hard to parse it even. Uh, that might have been performance mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it might just be me i don't know but you got another one for us yes i do have another one and this one is from david elrich from IndieWire, and this is a letterbox i think it's one of the most popular reviews in letterbox it has 2500 likes which is very high and it's uh it's about spider-man into the spider-verse so the review goes tragic news for anyone who's sick of superhero movies Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse completely reinvigorates the genre, reaffirms why it's resonating with a diverse, modern audience that's desperate to fight the power, and reiterates how, to us how these hyper-popular spandex myths are able to reinvent themselves on the fly whenever things get stale. Just when it seemed like Infinity War might be the culmination of a cultural phenomenon, a Stan Lee's death could symbolize the end of an era comes along a delirious postmodern spectacle to remind us that these movies will exist for as long as people need to see themselves reflected in them. Sometimes they can feel like a threat watching into the Spider-Verse. It's more like a promise. So these are the two reviews. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like it was about Black Panther or something. Is there some aspect of that? Yes, to, uh, yes. I think yeah. into the Spider Verse, the the Spider Man is now uh, uh, Hispanic, half black, Afro Latino, 
Uh, oh, well, they yeah, they should change a letter in his name, I guess. Um, <sighs> was there a, a line in that review that said something like whites identifying with a diverse audience or something like that? Oh, yeah. It, it's, uh, it doesn't say whites. It just says reaffirms whites resonating with a diverse modern audience that's desperate yeah. to fight the power. Eey. <laughs> oh, you, you like that? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's really good. That's really yeah, that's really great. Uh, the whole review is worth reading. It's on Indie Wire, but uh, I think like the first quote is about essentially what I take from it is that uh, movies are like, and Hollywood is like an occupying force, They're like a military, and Disney is like the leader of that force. Disney has something like fifty percent of revenues at the box office. Uh, now that it acquired Fox and uh, this is like Disney and Marvel are kind of like the um, the main thing the main throughput at the box office and the other part I think is that I think like what was explosive about radicalism in the 60s was that people took these propositions that sound kind of ridiculous it's kind of like well movies aren't actually like an occupying force or like the police aren't actually like a hostile military occupation. But they read these things and they took them very seriously. And they kind of took it kind of, they kind of took them to logical conclusions. They had the kind of respect to these ideas. And I think we should take this idea that Disney in particular is like a, uh, like a collaborating, like a Vichy France thing. It's like it occupies our land. It's people who we know, right? They're, they're Americans, but they are like loyal to another country, to another state. And they're <laughs> Which like, state would that be? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know, but uh, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna make myself unemployable. But it, it seems like uh, there's just like no nothing in common in the culture that it represents with the culture that I don't know, like I want in my in my state. And it seems like they should suffer the same consequences that collaborators and the Vichy uh, administrators suffered at the end of the war, which is that I think they all should be taken to gallows and then all the collaborators should be taken to a concentration camp uh, and all the women should be shaved uh, bald, like at the end of the... Anyway, that's kind of what I feel. Uh, and I think that, that, that that's like the proposition that also the Godard makes is that like you have to take ideas that seem kind of ridiculous from the beginning to the, a possible conclusion. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm incorrect and maybe I just feel like uh, I'm just disconnected from other people and they haven't, you know, maybe I'm just not understanding what the universe of concerns of other people is. Well, I guess like, I mean, I think that what you said, you know, the review of the Spider-Verse movie, you know, that, that reflects what a lot of people actually do feel about it like so it's like you know it's just a fun movie to them and they see it as uh you know they're not when they see me and rebellion or fighting back and stuff they mean it in a kind of mild way it's not like it's not like that they're lying about it really i don't think it's just that they think that fighting back means something much less to them you know it means something like continuing to improve the culture in minor ways to address things like racism or something like that they don't mean it in some overturn of everything or something like that so i guess that's like it's it's hard for me to position myself in that in that it's like uh you know should i just not care about that stuff and just you know because i i watch all the same like i watch all the big movies that come out generally just because i really enjoy going to a theater and all that kind of stuff right and you know i can watch them and have fun and then i have this kind of creeping suspicion underneath it that something's wrong you know what i mean that like i will watch it and i'll have fun and then i kind of go wait a minute why are people enjoying this too much kind of thing right and you know i thought we were you know we'll eventually we'll get into it we'll, with the different movies about like you know the a24 movies and all that kind of thing uh this kind of comes into to relief once we're shifting from these big box office ones to ones that are more specifically maybe not art films, but like artsy in some way or concept based or something like that, because that's probably where it's in the most relief for me because I see, you know, if no one expects, well, a lot of people do expect maybe Captain Marvel and stuff to be a thing, but people that I consider intelligent and insightful 
you know, I would, they're not going to ever say that about most of those big ones, right? But they will say that about all of the, you know, A24 or not art house, but like, you know, in between kind of, you know, the middle sort of market for that. And that concerns me. That kind of worries me a bit because I'm like, wait a minute, there's something I'm missing here or something that, you know, that that feels like a scary proposition to me. So, yeah. Sure. And I, I agree with that. I think there is like a there's a separation or like two different markets essentially for uh, like an upmarket kind of a criterion yeah. audience. And there is a kind of a, a schlock or a blockbuster audience. But now that I think we are in quarantine, we can kind of talk about this more, I think, more seriously, because I think um, I think this fragmentation between different like audiences and different uh, publics is going to take like a, a much further step. In particular, I think there was like a kind of an explosion or a boom of art house cinemas uh, since 2005. There's like a bunch of them, at least in America, in North America, there's a bunch of uh, smaller theaters that kind of opened up or reopened. And I think they all kind of took the COVID hit and I don't think they'll be reopening anytime soon. So the experience of going to a cinema, like a smaller or uh, a cinema that shows like smaller films might be going away for the foreseeable future. I don't think they can sustain themselves by having like one of the smaller cinemas I go to has like, you know, maybe... 100 seats so they won't be able to sustain themselves by having eight people attended at most um so that's maybe that just might be over like cinema in the sense of going to a, a theater and sitting in front of it, like a projection might be going away and one might be like streaming stuff or might be going to like a multiplex i'm not sure exactly how it's going to work out but that experience might be going away as such well, you said the other thing is I think that the the two traditions I think of cinema of like a mainstream or blockbuster audience and the kind of tradition of quality or of a kind of festival cinema, I think they are actually much closer than, you know, you probably like also agree with that. They are actually quite close, but they are actually quite close in quality and quite close in what they represent. And in like a lot of the festival cinema is in fact like funded or made with a with a view towards a kind of a box office success at least for a in a smaller scale in much the same way that the blockbuster cinema is and yeah. it's made just as commercially and it's made by people who are essentially like kind of tv hucksters and tv and producer kind of blockbuster hucksters as um like the big cinema is there's very yeah, I mean, like jordan peele is a perfect example right yeah, like I, I think we, I think we have similar opinions on Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele is like a TV guy, like his sensibility is television. He, um, I saw Get Out in theaters, and I haven't seen Us, but uh, Get Out is like a Key and Peele sketch, except it's night, like whatever, a hundred minutes long, and it's just that it's just played very straight, and um, people loved it. People ate it up because it was a moment when this kind of stuff was very opportune and they saw it and they were like, Oh, okay. This is like a racial comedy, uh, with like a little bit of titillation, a little bit of horror, uh, mystique, and we can sell it right now. We can't sell it. You know, they couldn't have sold it in, you know, in 2010, they couldn't have sold it in 2020, but they could have sold it when they did. And it hit. Um, and now Jordan Peele is like a cultural mainstay. He's going to be, you know, twilight zone, notwithstanding, he's probably going to be making films until we we're dead basically because he managed to hit that one hit. Uh, and I think he's very insubstantial. And I think like a lot of that sort of those types of movies are very, very insubstantial and um, yeah, will be forgotten in like four years. Like for, Get Out, I think, is in the process of being forgotten completely. Another couple of movies. Remember 12 Years a Slave that won the Oscar <laughs> for Best Movie? Yeah, I never saw that one. Yeah, I couldn't see it because I just, I just thought it was... I, like I heard it was just like... I don't know, like torture and stuff. Like just like I heard, you know, like a lot of it was just uh, like it, it seemed like cheap kind of violence kind of thing, you know, like uh, didn't seem like uh, I don't know. It just it seemed bizarre to me that that there is this kind of whole thing. And I think horror is probably more explicitly this, but it's just very strange to me that people sign up for things that 
have some sort of like vague political co- sort of connection and then uh their actual experience of it is just like people getting beaten and stuff like that i don't know it's just very strange to me because it's like i don't know it's like a it's it's a film but you're like the whole process to me is just strange like you're paying 10 bucks whatever and then you're gonna go sit down and watch someone get beaten up and then leave i don't know i just uh yeah, yeah. kind of reminds know. me of like, like passion of the christ when that came out and like yeah. all the like the christian fundamentalists and stuff went crazy for it and it was just like oh it's just 90 minutes of a guy getting whipped by <laughs> roman soldiers and it's like okay all yeah right. that's maybe like an extreme example of the same kind of phenomenon yeah yeah so yeah, I think that's that's true, and I think there's a kind of a there's a tendency I think in in cinema of like when you go to a movie of quality, right, like of of a festival film, like uh, or like the one that kind of concerns very intellectual, heady topics that are very relevant, you aren't meant to react to it just as it ex- like kind of unfolds on the screen. You're meant to react to it with an eye towards how other people react to it. Uh, in like um, in unbearable lightness of being, Milan Kundera talks about like how there are two tears that a sentimentalist cries. A sentimentalist cries two tears. One tear, like when you see like a child do something like um, kind of really touching, or you know like when you see something that's really emotionally involving, you cry a tear. And then you cry the second tear because you cry at yourself. You see yourself as someone who's like a person who like enjoys you know, higher pleasures and you see how great it is to be with other people, you know, in a theater watching Get Out and learning about how great it is to be a liberal and how great it is that we're all learning and we're all advancing. And I think that's essentially what's happening with like a lot of racial cinema right now. And like you see a lot of people kind of, you see like these like reading lists for people because Black Lives Matter died in, you know, whenever there was an election 2016. And then it kind of came back around whenever another election came around. Interesting how that happened. And uh, yeah, it's just strange how, how that happened again. And uh, everyone kind of started talking about like, oh, yeah, you got to watch all this stuff and you got to figure out all this, you know, read all these books about, uh, you know, race and white fragility and other, other things like that. And you don't read those books to read them. You read them to with an eye towards like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be like, you know, advanced now. I, got, I understand race. You know, I'm, I'm with George Floyd and that kind of thing. So that's always, like, I think that a factor for the for these movies' popularity is that you're not just participating in a in a spectacle. You're not just watching, like, a Hitchcock movie or an Otto Preminger movie or, like, a Samuel Fuller, uh, Fuller movie. You're watching a movie of relevance and of quality. And that's, I think, a selling point is that like, that's how they get you, is that you're not just watching a movie, you're watching an art house production, um, which I also find like it's a dirty marketing trick is that they got you. They, they kind of, you know, they, they didn't, they couldn't get you by selling you like a fun, like thrill ride. So they got you on the other side, they got you on the flip side by selling you, uh, you know, a deep contemplation of the universe or whatever. And yeah. I feel just as used. I feel like just as as if I went to an Avengers movie, which I like. All of those movies don't look very good. Like if you've been to an Avengers movie, like they, they it feels very empty. Like the way you get out, I feel like there's like a recycling bin cinema of like there's a limited amount of space in my head for things that don't really matter, and I just fill them up with like cultural media, like TV shows that I see, and then they just kind of automatically clear out at the end, and they leave no trace. It's like a really nice like fast food meal. It's just like you just have a meal, you go to the bathroom, you clear it out. It's a nice little experience and it's gone. There's nothing left. And that's how I feel about a cinema is that like you go, you spend the time, you spend the two hours and you experience the thing and then it's completely gone. And if you go through like um, through can, like through Palm Door winners for the last like 20 years, these are forgettable movies that you will forget like almost immediately. And we'll talk about Parasite later, but like, I think like these will be just complete, like clean fast food entertainment gone in a day, but marketed very differently, which makes them kind of, which gives them a kind of an intellectual surge, but of no value whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I, 
I think you're right about the whole uh, experiencing yourself watching the movie and learning from the movie or participating in some sort of social event is the real draw for a lot of these types of things. That seems kind of spot on for me. And, uh, you, you know, I, th- I think that's pretty sad in a lot of ways. Um, but it's, what's especially sad about it to me is it's not it's not like there's a select few like capital I important movies that come out every so often that people kind of give this sort of aura to now it's like even like Avengers movies get this kind of aura and people like treat treat them like like in the same way right like the you know it's it's a different I guess sort of thing but it's the the same essential experience of like I, I don't really understand it at all. I don't know anyone who gets into those movies. I don't really understand what that is like, but uh, it definitely seems, it, it just feels the same way when you see people talking about it and writing about it and stuff. It seems like they're kind of doing the same thing. And there's, there's this weird, like they're glorifying the product that they're consuming and stuff and, and making it into this big thing that, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's kind of, dumb because like you said it's just ultimately disposable i don't think these movies really sit with people for very long and yet they like blow it up into this big thing so that it can feel like an experience i do think that that's true about you know there's this uh compression that's happening where like a lot of schlock is being treated as high art or something or something that has a lot of things which isn't necessarily bad bad if the criticism of it is good kind of thing but it instead it's just it's become this bizarre polarization where it's not like talking about the actual product as much as just symbols within it and stuff. I uh, like as I said, I've seen most of the big comic book movies and stuff. It's it's bizarre to see the um, reviews afterwards where I can re- I, I I can like them. I can just be like, okay, that's a fun movie to watch. Whatever, that's fine. But it is strange that it gets treated in this kind of. Uh, just by mentioning things or by having a very basic representation in it that becomes sufficient for meeting the quota kind of thing of being representative or being critical and uh even if the acting is bad or like the the there's not much to it beyond that kind of thing it's all it's all like uh you know like gif replies kind of stuff you know like all that's that's sufficient to make it a good movie kind of thing but i I, again i it's it's hard because you know if that's the baseline that people are working with then i can kind of understand where people would go okay anything that is is at least basically competent as filmmaking kind of thing not even not not you know not approaching it as you know innovative or whatever just has any ideas in it i think people then feel like licensed to get extra excited about it or something right or something thinking that that's great filmmaking and all that and that's setting new heights and film and all that kind of stuff so i can kind of get that at some level but you know when i talk to people that are you know get into that kind of mode about it like they're soy facing about a24 films or something that kind of thing right uh the thing that i don't get is that i don't get a sense that they know that there's more than that you know what i mean like that's this thing that kind of scares me is that i don't get a sense that there's that there is a difference between um or there is like some extra process going on there kind of thing where you know that there's you know it, it's it's like uh that's what kind of scares me is that you know it's not that captain marvel is just has incredibly terrible sequences that just are nonsense and then people you know average people like them it's more people that like i trust that seem like they can't make that connection it's like it's like they're the ones that are occupied by disney right so i don't know so you know (laughs) yeah i think it's both like i think like there is a kind of a there's a critical inflation so you're talking about like if if there is like a baseline of superhero movies then everything else will look like you know dostoevsky like everything will look like kind of profound meditation but also i think on the other hand i think there is not really like a critical vocabulary for like things beyond, like there's not really like a, like you don't really know why Antonioni or Godard are greater than people who make A24 movies. I don't really think there's like a serious like attempt to kind of distinguish them. And the categories that people use are like 
acting and cinematography and like i don't think that you can really tell the difference by like you know how well acted a movie is and um i just think like there isn't really like a critical difference between those two things it's just like you have to kind of impose a higher standard like if you wanted to if everything is judged by how good black panther is it will be just that it will just be like oh yeah this is slightly better than black panther this is much better than black panther but there has to be a kind of an extra like there has to be an extra criterion like something that's like you know artistic or um has a kind of a quality beyond that like just not just being able to evoke I mean, an image in your head of racial harmony or um you know history or something like that it has to be kind of seriously taking the idea of aesthetic like sophistication and that doesn't exist that just doesn't you know doesn't happen yeah so i think i have that inability to appreciate that um like I, when i watch like a movie like blow up like you mentioned antonioni uh i it kind of feels like an a24 movie to me like it's fine and I, i'm like okay that was pretty good and that's kind of how i feel watching a24 movies most i'm some of them are bad and i'm just like well that was stupid but the ones that are better i'm like okay that was fine and i just move on like it doesn't doesn't really do anything for me beyond that it's just kind of like two hours some amusement some entertainment and that's it and film doesn't ever really go much beyond that for me so um maybe maybe the thing is there's a lot of people that are like at that level of appreciation of film and i don't no, I, I don't think I'm like, I don't think there's something wrong with me. That's, I think that's like, uh, you know, just that's how some people are. And, uh, but they don't want to sit, they don't want to just like accept that and just be like, well, you know, movies are kind of just whatever to me. Instead, it's got to be like, oh, they're so important. There's this thing going on. And it's like, uh, you know, they don't actually get it. So it's almost like they're just parroting some language and, and just like imitating the act of like, being you know inspired and in and, and all of these films and stuff when it's like they don't really know what what it's uh really supposed to be or something like that you know do you get what i'm saying yeah yeah uh i was going to talk about like language uh mm-hmm. like before i kind of get into it i do want to say like blow up i think that one of the points of blow up was is that like there is a kind of a transience to the image and it's like it's it's this like it's not meant to be i think a kind of a profound reflection on anything it's meant to be like again like a uh a kind of a i guess a reflection on on how you know new media and marketing and photography works so i don't think it's meant to be like you know this great thing that kind of a masterwork in this way but um when it comes to language i think that there is a, a literally like on the level of a sentence there is a lack of uh being able to describe why something is good and it reflects itself in these like really tortured like devices that people use. And I talk about like there are two, usually it's like on the level of two words. There is one word, which is like a superlative, which means like it's like a really high, it's really good. And there is something abstract. So you take a superlative and you take something abstract. And usually it's something like uh, deeply felt or a profound meditation. That's how people describe a movie. It's like uh something really high and something really like impossible to explain so you know like they would describe like uh a blow up it would be like a profound meditation on the nature of cinema or something and that tells me nothing that tells me like the first word tells me nothing the second word tells me nothing it's just like it's it's just i don't know it just frustrates me yeah it Uh, tells you nothing about the film but it tells you everything about how to like negotiate the film as like this viewing experience. Like it's sort of like, um, you know, the descriptions on bottles of wine, you know, like those apparently I've been told are just complete bullshit. Like, you know, all the, the, the woody notes and all that kind of stuff that they put on there. It's just like a a floral nose. You don't think that's real. (laughs) I I mean, I, I have no idea. I haven't drank wine in a very long time, but uh yeah i that from what i've been told the people that write those and stuff it's just nonsense like they just write things that it's it's marketing speak it's supposed to make you 
see the product as something that is oh this is like a what sophisticated people would buy or whatever and it's and the price point is low enough that it's like oh this isn't too bad and it sounds pretty good and, da, da, da. and I, I think that's kind of the same thing going on with the movie reviews it's like the same people writing these almost you know it's you, you puff up the the movie a little bit oh it's a profound meditation and i'm gonna go profoundly meditate on this subject you know yeah and the other thing is like there's like two forms that was the first form like uh, you have like a really abstract airy thing and then there is another thing which i really hate which is that movies are very technical there's a lot of like technical work and you have to kind of say something about like how something is staged how something is like shot on the camera and usually the way you kind of get rid of that in the review you just you just say like you have like a, a very um kind of like, uh, again, an abstract or superlative thing and combine it with a technical aspect. But you never explain what that means. So, for example, you say something like, oh, this is like a gorgeously shot or a beautifully, you know, like a beautifully staged movie or a very expressively uh, expressively um, kind of edited movie or something like that. You say like literally on the level of a sentence, you just take like two words. One word means something technical and one word means something aesthetic. But you never explain like how a movie, I never understand like how a movie is gorgeously shot. Like what are ugly, like what are movies that are not gorgeously shot? What are movies that are like non-sentimentally shot? What makes one movie shot gorgeously and one shot like shoddily or whatever, like badly? Uh, That's never, no one ever talks about that. And I feel like that's like, it's just like this like level of engagement of like this very superficial. It's like, oh yeah, there is. There's an outdoor sequence with a, with a moonlight in it, and that's gorgeously shot. Um, there's a dolly sequence with the, the you know the camera kind of winds around uh, a person or something, and that's gorgeous or whatever. But like I don't get like why that's good. I don't understand like why that's elevating or why that's better than just you know plain shot of a person standing there. And I think it's it's again the, these both techniques are just ways of like obscuring the relationship between the image and the like i guess experience like it's it's there are these tricks that the camera plays and then these tricks that the um scenario plays that don't uh ever like are never explained but are always described so um and it happens i think like every review has to follow the same like formula with those with respect to those devices and usually they use the same words. So I found this when I was looking. Remember uh, Nanette? Do you remember that stand-up oh, special? Oh, yeah. That revolutionary work. It changed stand-up forever. Yeah. So I search whenever Nanette came out, I search for words that are like searing. <laughs> searing is a word that's only used in cooking context and in context of like art criticism. No one ever talks about like, Oh yeah, I had a really searing afternoon or like I had a really like, you know, I had a conversation that was really searing to me. It's always a movie or a performance or an art piece. And Nanette, I think like every single review that I've read or I've found has features the word searing in it because it's so like, you know, she talks about her things. I haven't seen Nanette, but I, I'm sure that it's very profound, but it's very like, that's the word that everyone uses. I think it's one of the first press releases about her use the word searing and everyone who ever wrote about it, they looked at the press release or the previous reviews and went like, Oh yeah, that's the word we got to use. And this like literally duplicates the experience that they have, like the language that they use will, will like the naming of their experience will be, Oh yeah, this is what searing means. This is, and then that is the searing thing. You just like match makes a match. And I think that's how it happens. I think that's how these words, the parasitic like qualities of like, Oh yeah, gorgeous lighting or profound or deep or meditative things. That's how they kind of find their way into reviews. Uh, Jonathan Rosenbaum, when he was writing about um, uh, Oliver Stone did a movie about Nixon called Nixon and every single review used the word Shakespearean because the, I think the publicist's notes said that this was a Shakespearean character. So every single review, you look at it, Washington Post, New York Times, Time Magazine, you know, like all the big publication, every single one of them use the word Shakespearean. Um, you know, it's about a movie about Nixon present day, but everyone like, kind of, you know, everyone had the same idea at the same time. And like A24 movies, like uh, Uncut Gems uses the word frenetic, you know, frenetic, 
how that that's a word that you use commonly like a train ride is very frenetic i don't use that ever like i only use it whenever people talk about the pace of a movie and uncut gems every single review features the word frenetic or like fast paced something like that something that only exists in the movie universe and it again it finds its way in every single like idea that people have and twitter is really good for that because you can really see that people who have like independent experiences they're not paid by the distributor they're not paid by the studio they just kind of have the same idea and the same word like every single time and to me that's like a scary thing that's like a i don't know maybe it's an obvious thing that you know people have the same reaction to the same stimuli but to me it's like yeah again like it's scary because the publicist kind of programmed these words into you from the beginning from the get-go and you are just reflecting that that's all you are you're just like a, a reflector of the consciousness of the person that essentially sold the movie yeah that's kind of what i what i dislike yeah that's i don't know that's it, it's uh it's humbling in some ways i think because uh, it's easy to point to other people and say that that's probably happening but you do have to then kind of turn on yourself and be like wait a minute like you know, I'm starting to think right now, like, which, which I, I, I write like little short joke reviews sometimes, but, you know, I got to wonder how many of those use the exact same language that the sincere one in the New York Times did or whatever because of a press kit or something, right? So, I don't know. Yeah, that's strange. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I think that's part of the whole issue of the sort of getting out of it, though, kind of thing, right? Like, how do you, how do you, uh, is it something that has to be, changed collectively is it or is it something that you can kind of just work on yourself and you know try to like build self-defense to this kind of thing you know like do you is it something where because i mean if if there is a potentially different culture out there theoretically there's like a huge gap there that could be exploited right like there's a huge if there's some sort of hunger for something different out there then the ability to do something competently and then put it forward should you would think maybe uh be a opportunity like a lane there kind of for people but uh you know i guess there's also maybe a more doomer view of that which is that uh that is closing because of you know sort of like a dumbing down or or a marketing like behemoth kind of thing out there that you know it just gets suppressed until everyone has the same opinions or, you know, forever kind of thing or something, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is to that. So, yeah. I think it's not really a question of discipline. I think it's more like a, there's a culture of reflection, which is, I think, affiliated with the cinema of quality, is that the way you appreciate a cinema of quality is that you reflect on your own and then you kind of spew out this reflection of kind of like, oh, you know, and you list out the inventory of the feelings that you had. There could be a potentially other response to cinema, like um, like cinema at its best. I think it's meant to like provide you with images, like really stark images, and not really. I think novels are better for ethical development or like a moral development of a plot or something like that. And theater is better for performances. And what cinema is meant to do, like on its own, is meant to provide like combine images and sound in a way that that evokes really sharp and different response and it doesn't have to be theatrical and doesn't have to be novelistic it could be its own thing but then to respond to it unlike the verbal arts unlike drama or unlike uh, a novel you would respond to it with images or you would respond to it with a kind of a, a different kind of view like you wouldn't be able to uh, like I don't think like reviews of contemporary art are very similar to film criticism is that I don't think you respond to art the way like you know like you don't like to describe different parts of the like painting and you don't go like oh yeah the brush strokes here are really profound or something like that that would be silly instead you would try to kind of evoke an image or um, kind of you know try to evoke an atmosphere of it you wouldn't try to you wouldn't try to write about it like you would like an itinerary of particular like a parts or like a technical kind of summary so that's one thing and i think the other thing is that i'm not really a pessimist in the sense that i don't think that there's like a closing but uh i do think that there is a real like lack of 
um, like critical understanding. Like I don't think there's like a real. I don't think these movies are criticized very much, and I think whenever they are criticized, they absorb the criticism as like you know like with common defenses, which is snobbery. You know, you're just a snob. You don't understand what you know what people want, or a kind of a like a, um, a kind of identity politics idea of like well you know you're just white or you just you're not really understanding what you know black people want in this country and until there is a real reaction to it in terms of at the level of production i don't think you can really do anything it's like if 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 you wanted to be a vegan in this country i think it would be very you know and by veganism you'd also want everyone else to be vegan that'd be very difficult because there's a you know there's a billion chickens killed every year or whatever but if you wanted to change it on the level of production i think that would be you know that that's the that's the only possible way but you can't do it by just like writing on i don't know veganreviews.com uh or whatever i don't think you could just do it by going to vegan restaurants um yeah one thing about movies i guess is that it it's uh they're very intensive in terms of like what it takes to make one right it takes like a lot of money you know, you need someone with money to provide that. You need to hire a lot of people. The equipment is fairly expensive compared to other pieces of art, right? Like a novel or or painting or something like that. Those are fairly low intensity in terms of the requirements. And I, I just wonder how much of that uh, plays into all of this, you know? Like if, when we're talking about how much the marketing seems to have taken over the experience of these movies... I wonder if it has ever, if there was, if there's really an alternative to that, because it, it sort of seems like you, because of how um, big of a production they are, it seems like that's going to always be part of it. Like it, it's, it's like almost necessary to it that the experience is, is mediated by, you know, capital for lack of a better word. If you, if you get what I'm saying. Sure. I think there is a, that's definitely true of like cinema of like, you know, if you wanted to make a blockbuster, you have to play along. But I think, you know, all you need is a camera and that's pretty cheap. And all you need is like a bunch of people to stand in front of the camera and that's free. So I don't know. That's to me, that's not very expensive. And uh, yeah, I, I may be kind of speaking a little bit uh, like historically, I suppose it's, it's different nowadays. Yeah. But like, I feel like the, like the great, period of cinema in the 60s began essentially with people going well we don't really need a studio we don't really need to shoot in the studio we could just shoot we could buy these cheap cameras we could buy a fast uh stock that didn't require lighting and we can you know we can shoot sound very quickly and that really changed i think cinema that really made what we think of today like you know the criterion collection or whatever uh that's the really like that's the bulk of it is that movies that were made very quickly very cheaply comparatively and um today i think that that's like a lot of the cinema of quality is made this way so it's very cheap comparatively it doesn't have to be related like i think today like um the movie that's um i wasn't sure i don't remember exactly what the website was but there's a website that kind of like found like what's the greatest like film of 2019 2020 currently in the like uh, box office closing and in Europe, I think the, the movie that won is uh, uh, Vitalina Varela by uh, Pedro Costa, which is Pedro Costa's latest film. And it's it's shot, I think, it's fairly cheaply done. Pedro Costa only works with non-professional actors. And I don't think it's very marketed very strongly. It's essentially done outside of this whole like system of, of having like a, you know, an A24 distributor kind of come into your theater and show you the trailer a million times and then you know the new york times writes a review it's done very differently and i don't really feel like there's like a kind of a gloom about the form in this way but there is a gloom about like the reality the actual like what the, the everyday experience is so there are possibilities right there's always possibilities of different you know of different art kind of breaking through but what takes up the bulk of experience is the blockbuster and the um the film of quality so i don't think there is a you know there, there is a possibility there's always a possibility of something different but i think it's a kind of waning one and a lot of the filmmakers that are kind of associated with something other than what exists 
have come of like age in the 60s and 70s and 80s and are not coming through today in the same way. Um, so some of the stuff I'm starting to think about like uh, writing and uh, the publishing industry as uh, having similar kind of trends in terms of marketing dominating and then, you know, that sort of bending back on itself in terms of determining the kind of product uh, and how that relates to things like the fact that uh, most, you know, newspapers have, you know, the, I think the circulation for newspapers has collapsed, uh, maybe, maybe a bit different in the last few years, but just because of Trump and stuff like that. But yeah, like the, at the very least, like the staffs have been cut back hugely and all of the, a lot of the writing is very low quality compared to what it could be theoretically, like in terms of journalism and stuff, most, most kind of product that kind of gets out there for journalism now tends to be just opinion pieces and stuff like that kind of in different ways a lot of it and uh in terms of like what people actually you know they they share the headlines and all that kind of stuff right and uh a lot less actual engagement i think with the writing and uh even like the you know the awards processes and stuff are uh i think um i can't remember the details but like i think last year or earlier this year one of the major awards was split between to uh there's a there's a podcast i listened to called print run which they were talking about like uh this award where they split it with uh margaret atwood and another writer um they split the award even though the, their board told them they weren't allowed to do that really because uh and it was very clear that it was like this attempt at like okay well this writer is an established writer and she deserves to win because she's like you know her she's got like a new book out and it's really good or whatever so uh and then we have a new writer who maybe deserves it more in terms of the content or something like that or maybe because we want to promote her or whatever you know it's not clear what the reasoning really it's more that uh it's 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 just the structure of it. it's kind of interesting because it's like how all of this marketing works now right like it's all it's all uh monopolized in some respects like into these big publishing companies that keep consolidating and stuff and i guess maybe i don't know i'm just trying to suggest an analogy there between all different types of culture and this process of you know monopolization and uh you know like i mean even for reviews of writing i'm sure would probably fit maybe even closer to this model of from press release to the actual review kind of thing so yeah yeah that's true i think there, there are essentially like secular trends in, in these like readership and in consumption of media that don't depend on like particular you know situations that people read less people want to you know engage in shorter times there's a funny article in new york times where they interview like a bunch of uh, studio execs after covid and they kind of go like, yeah, we want to just basically be Twitch or like be like uh, Instagram stories. Like we, we, that's what we want to do now. We just want to do like short content that would be like on television or on your streaming platforms. Um, and I think that's true. Like for like, you know, if you want to do like really mobile, really I don't know, enterprising kind of startup stuff is you kind of try to find new ways of doing it. And the legacy like output is very much everyone understands that this isn't it can't last like uh, and for cinema like the two-hour feature film will probably be going away at some point or moving to streaming or something like that i don't know it, it's yeah that, that's what i kind of mean, meant earlier when i said like like the experience of going to the cinema um to watch like a good movie or to watch something that's going on right now that might be gone fairly soon um yeah, I guess like, uh, well, I mean, the way that they're doing it in Canada, I don't know about there, but the way that the they've sort of shifted to try to create a market for certain types of films is that other than the big blockbuster ones, whatever, um, is to uh, um, charge more and like upscale the experience so that like you're paying $25 to go see a movie and it's like in, you know, plush chairs and all that kind of stuff and um, to your seat service and stuff. And I know there are sort of equivalents of that in the States where they, um, have certain, sort of something, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot like that, but, uh, that's sort of the, 
strategy for them to kind of fill that gap is to more explicitly turn it into a niche experience. And I think that's probably true, I think, with books in a lot of ways, too, that there's this giant market of um, books for things like, you know, the, the new romance novels and new fantasy novels and stuff and YA stuff and all that. There's like a, a giant market for that kind of stuff. And then I think there's like literary novels that, you know, there's, there's, it's there. It's monopolized by a small number of publishers. And I also think that, like, I honestly think that, you know, nonprofit books, I mean, nonfiction books, I think a lot of them are just are not read. I think that they just get sent out to places and people buy a few of them and stuff. But I feel like most of them just sit on shelves or, or get read bits and pieces, but not, I feel like the, culture of people who sit down and read through a, a large number of books a year and read mostly cover to cover uh, is very very small and uh, you know like uh, it, a lot of those people have jobs that directly depend on that or they are for friends that are part of that kind of familia or whatever so I don't know that's kind of a interesting thing too because I feel like that's new in some respects I feel like maybe in the past there was more I don't know like more reading at least in that kind of sense i don't know so i feel like this i mean i think about this kind of stuff for writing and stuff because uh you know i've gotten pretty good at like telling very short jokes or something like that to some people but like to then try to think beyond that and go okay what should i be doing should i try to shift that into you know a non-fiction book or something like that like it's like should you know i i get pretty down on it pretty quickly a lot of the time because it's like you know, I feel like, you know, are, are people sending these books out to just sit on shelves or something like that kind of thing, you know? So I don't know. Yeah, don't worry, Donald. I know what you can do. TikTok. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Oh, no. That's good. <laughs> That's good now. Uh, <laughs> just point at the little captions that pop up on the screen, you know? Yeah. Do a little dance and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything, like, more, like, degenerate in the most, like, negative way than young adult literature like ya to me is like very obviously like i don't know pedophilia but uh i don't know <laughs> like very obviously just linked to that people who haven't grown up who just want to feel the aura of younger people um yeah there just... might be something to that i think there's also just like people don't have an ability to like just handle like you know, like like you mentioned Dostoevsky, like that kind of level of literature anymore. Like it's just, I mean, I have, I, I used to read that stuff constantly when I was younger and I have trouble keeping up with, with it today too, just because like my attention span is shot, you know? You so, mean Harry Potter, like, you know, well, uh, Handmaid's Tale. I haven't gotten that bad, but no. uh, yeah, there. I think it's, it's just, it's easier to read. So people will just read it and then just kind of force you know, force the experience to cover the gap. Like, well, it's not quite Brothers Karamazov, but I'm just going to act as if it is. So it's good enough. I don't know. It kind of gets back to that point of like the, the real experience is, is your, you know, you viewing yourself as having that experience, I guess. Um, before we move on from the big subject, I thought, you know, you wanted to talk a bit about Parasite, I believe, so. Oh, sure. Yeah, I just saw Parasite, like, earlier at 6. Uh, like, I saw, sat down and watched it. I wasn't going to watch it ever, uh, but I decided, okay, this I need to because this is the zeitgeist. The one. You're a bad Hegelian, I guess. Th that's right, yeah. Like, I, can, <laughs> I, I mean, I have to feel the immediacy of experience. I can't just, you know, I can't just, you know, use it with intuition. So I saw it uh, very, not really bad, but just, like, televisual. It's very televisual. It's like a television. Like you would you would catch it on TV. Everything looks very just drab and boring. Everyone looks like a TV actor. Everyone overacts. It feels a lot like there is like uh, I don't hate it, but like there is like the director has like um, he was commissioned for four episodes of thirty five minutes or whatever, and he delivered four episode of thirty five minutes. He didn't deliver a movie, and um, it feels like there are these like really sharp sections, but within each section there's like a complete unity. So it doesn't feel like it's like subverting anything. It's just like you're introduced to this thing and then the plot happens in these like small events that you kind of experience. 
but it's just so like the ambition is so very low um it's a bit of like a comedy and a little bit like a drama a melodrama and it's just like deflating it's a deflating experience one thing that really annoyed me about it is that there is an epilogue and there's like a kind of a without spoiling uh there's like a a big event that happens at the end which is like where a play would end at that point like that would be like that's when the stimulus or the energy of the narrative is dissipated completely and then there's an epilogue at the end which kind of like explains what the themes are and kind of goes like oh yeah and then this is what happened to all the main players and Francois Truffaut in his like big article that everyone quotes called uh, a certain tendency in French cinema talks about how this uh, uh, screenwriter that his primary like target of his was like uh, I think he's not, uh, his name is Jean Orange and he wrote this like uh, scenario a script for Diary of the Country Priest uh, Bernanos and um, the Bernanos was alive at the time and said no I'm not gonna allow this to be made into a movie but one thing that was there is that like he couldn't incorporate a very crucial scene about the priest and like an atheist having like a dialogue because it involved a lot of like uh, ethical and moral dimensions that couldn't be filmed. So what the uh, the what the scriptwriter proposed is that instead of that, instead of that conversation, at the end they would tag on like an epilogue. And spoiler alert for the diary of the country priest: this priest dies. And then at his funeral, there's like this debate about like the nature of faith or whatever, and about like what happens after you die. And this literally happens at the end of Parasite: is that there's like a funeral, and then there's like everyone kind of talks about what what everything like what the themes are, and everything is kind of tied together thematically. And it's just like this like lack of mastery of material, being able to incorporate it into the dramatic core of the movie is very evident it's just like in television you just kind of go through parts of you know what needs to happen like a soap opera you go through plot points and when there are things unexplained you tie it all up at the end and that's kind of what i felt about parasite it's just like not much happens and then at the end everything is explained to you anyway Hmm. i haven't seen it myself but I wonder if people that really love this movie, if they actually enjoyed that aspect of it, because it like tells you what to go talk about later on Letterboxd or whatever. Yeah, I think that that's literally true. Is that like it's just kind of like there are points of the movie where you like there are entrance points or like access points where like you go like, oh, and here's the anti-capitalist part of this movie. <laughs> here's yeah. like literally like a beat, and then there's like, oh yeah, and then we don't like the rich people or whatever. And uh, and here is like the kind of the representationalist part of the movie, and then after that the plot happens. Like it's just like the, the, the movie takes like a screeching halt, and then there is like a thing that happens that the, the characters discuss a thing, and that's the intellectual theme. And then later on they revisit it again. The, the plot, which is very busy plot, there's a lot of plot. It's two hours and like twenty minutes, and it's full of inconsequential events but that move along the stupid plot and then it comes to a halt and then they again they discuss it and they talk about like how rich people suck or whatever and it just happens over and over and it's yeah that's when you're supposed to reflect that's when you're like you're not watching the movie you're watching other people watching the movie with you you are shedding the second tier because it's like oh yeah we we don't we don't like the rich people do we we're all like you know it's really it really sucks it's like in in uh get out there's this moment that's widely parodied of like oh yeah this guy talks about like oh yeah i'd vote for obama three times if i could right it's like oh yeah i'm i'm a, I'm a good liberal and we all kind of mock the good white liberal but we are all also you know kind of complicit in that and we all feel kind of good and bad about it we all feel kind of complex that's the complex moment that's the quality moment that you get that's what you pay for so i don't know i just feel very bad about that like I, I feel like yeah again like you got sold a song you got sold something yeah and you bought it and i don't know 
Yeah, the way that that makes it feel like for me with a lot of these movies is that it just feels like most of the movie is almost, you know, perfunctory, like paint by numbers kind of stuff almost. Like there's no, I, I feel like I'm not going to be surprised except for maybe in some sort of trite plot point or something, you know? I don't know. Like that's just, that's just, that's the way I ended up, I feel a lot of them. So I don't, you know, like if I see two posters at a movie theater and one of them is uh, schlock and one of them is you know, a movie about like, you know, Winston Churchill or something. You know what I mean? Like some the Holocaust. Some, yeah, Holocaust. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, like uh, I'm not gonna go for the. I'm just gonna go for the shock because it's like I know that like one of them is gonna be like a British guy, like uh, you know, frowning for a while and then like triumphing, and the other one is gonna be like robots fighting or something. And I'm like, I'll just watch the robots fight. That's fine. But I do think like there's some, you know, I don't know. Like I, I, I was thinking this too about, you know, when you watch a movie like say the Avengers Endgame one that came out, I think that one was like two and a half, three hours or something like that too. It was, it was quite long. A good solid like hour of that movie is just stuff that is, it's, it's, I don't, it's, it's not even like thinly veiled. It's just very directly stuff that had to be in there because of like Disney and stuff, right? Like it's just, it's just stuff that is point by point, things that were a checklist of things that had to be put into the movie, uh, up to the point where there's a sequence near the end where John Favreau, who was a director of some of them and a producer and does a lot of these, you know, he's like a, one of Disney's top people now, basically. He has a sequence in the movie where it's just basically him you know, saying something to a child kind of thing. And it's just very clearly like, you know, had to have a nod to him in it, had to have a nod to, you know, had to have a sequence at the end where this actor does this thing to set up a movie, you had to do this thing because, but it was interesting because it, it's, it's like larded out in the movie where it's just like, it's so much in the movie is just that it's not even, it's gotten to the point where it's not even like the plot itself doesn't matter as much as having all these nods in the movie to other people, other things that are happening. So it's very strange in that way. And I feel like when I'm watching the, I, you know, call them movies for adults or something like that kind of thing, right? Like uh, if I'm watching the ones that are like an A24 or one or whatever kind of thing, I feel like it's almost the same way in that the nods are all there, but instead of to like other film executives or whatever, it's more to certain types of political sensibilities or certain types of, themes that are popular nowadays or something and that kind of scares me a bit because i'm like you know it just again that's a consumption thing you're just watching it to reinforce your views or something so you know yeah uh, i definitely think that it's the same like technique of like you know i think a lot of comic book movies today are meant are sold as entertainment but i've watched a few of them like i watched all the first generation avengers except avengers and I stopped after that because I didn't have to. But, um, you know, like, they're not entertaining movies. They're like, things happen because they have to happen in them. Uh, because you have to set up the next one or whatever the fuck, you know. And it's like a plot point. Like, it's you go through an itinerary of things that have to happen. And they happen, right? Like you go in, you know exactly what's going to happen. Or, you know, like, the you kind of know what's going to happen. At the end, the result is always going to be there's always going to be an Avengers movie where they all come together, and everything else is kind of secondary. And that's the secondary part is the plot of the movie and the characters or whatever. So, like, I don't know who, like, what's the entertainment? Like, where does the entertainment come in at that point? Like, I, I don't, yeah. I don't get it. I think, uh, I, I think, uh, I don't know. I just came up with this now, but I think like people who get into that like appreciate knowing. Oh, this scene is doing this for the overall arc of the series. Like, there's almost like this meta thing going on where the movie is servicing this broader thing, and you feel like you're sort of participating in it. Like, you're so almost like on the set watching it, and like, oh yeah, we got to do this because of that. Like, if you have this sort of knowledge about what has to happen in the movie and why this scene is there and why it's referencing this and that and how that fits into the whole universe of things. I think that kind of is part of the enjoyment for people who, who like these movies. That's just like a, I don't know. Yeah. Just throwing it out there. I think that's clearly true for something like star Wars or something like that kind of thing. Those, mm -hmm. you know, like it's just, it's a, uh, 
Yeah. Because a lot of these movies now are made by giant committees, right? That just like, right. Uh, that know what has to be in it at a minimum level, know who will be responsible for each thing. Uh, it gets to the point where, you know, the directors or whoever, whoever, like they, they don't really know, or the actors especially have no idea what's going on and are just emoting. And, um, <laughs> Barely, they don't know, yeah. you know, they don't know the, what's going to happen in the plot a lot of the times now. They don't know like, you know, very basic things. But I also think it's interesting that like, even if that were true, like, you know, like in the, in the, you know, that kind of whole process of engaging the audience on these sort of what they expect. It's interesting because a lot of the times the movies themselves don't even meet the, meet that level. They don't meet the level of basic competence in terms of stringing together the narrative between different movies and stuff. So I, you know, like, uh, between the two, uh, or maybe before, whatever, when, when the final Avengers kind of sequence was coming out, um, they, uh, put out Captain Marvel at a certain moment as a standalone movie that was basically supposed to set up her role in this final sequence kind of thing, right? As they did with anyone else kind of thing, right? They did with like a, almost a bunch of people. They sort of gave them their own standalone movies and it was supposed to be sort of explicitly like you know playing into the women can be superheroes too kind of thing right which had already been proven a bunch of times it's not but that they kind of made it a big part of it right and then in the final movie she has almost no real role like the the movie that that was she was supposed to be setting up as her you know you know captain marvel's in the in part of the team now she's gonna help whatever right uh at a certain point in the in the final movie the end game she basically goes okay well i'm gonna go help solve things over there or whatever kind of thing right and just leaves for a lot of the movie like just just is not involved she's involved at like a certain point in the final kind of sequences kind of thing but even then she has such a small point in the movie that it, it almost seems absurd in retrospect that they even set her up for anything because it could have been some, anyone else. It could have been anyone else in the movie could have taken that role, basically. And it's funny because that it's like it's made by these committees of people who don't even seem committed to like the very, very basics of constructing a narrative at all. Do you know what I mean? It's not just that it's bad. It's also that it's badly done at being bad or something like that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I don't know. I wonder if that doesn't even matter. Like the, yeah. the people that... Th there's no like person out that that, that, that like there is going to go see these movies that's just like, oh, well, there's a, this new movie. I guess I'll go see it. It, it seems like it's all geared towards s everyone having some level of investment in this like fandom. Yeah. And it, it, that itself has just become such a mass phenomena that you can just do that. You can just pump these things out and there's all these little winks and nods to these different things. And people just like that aspect of it. Uh, and, and you know, there's the whole identity politics stuff that is wrapped up into it too, that, you know, people are enjoying that as well. Yeah. It's kind of funny. I don't know. I was sort of thinking like that the way you're describing this is like, it's done by committee and, the, and you know, there's sort of like this popular participation, at least on the consumption side of, of, of the movies and everything that that's like a Soviet style system. It's like <laughs> yeah, an yeah, inheritor yeah. of Soviet cinema. But then I was thinking, I'm like, well, Soviet cinema is really like what we think of as like, you know, auteurs, like just with this like singular vision and they're like craft. It, n that was not directed by like the Politburo or anything. That was like very artistic in that kind of sense, you know? So it's kind of funny. I don't know. Yeah. Although also, I mean, uh, a lot of those, uh, you know, a lot of the films that came out in the Eastern Bloc were also, against or critical of the party or or not you know or that the they didn't really like they might have been good show pieces at a certain point but most of the time you know it's not like those things were always celebrated widely within them as examples of how great the system is kind of thing so yeah yeah kind of reminds me of like iranian cinema it's sort of it, it's got this weird thing where it's like uh the the state is is proud of it and it promotes it and supports it but at the same time it, be, they're letting them do their thing because it produces like a better quality cinema and that stands for itself and that kind of says something about the country promotes the country but but in doing so they allow like space for criticism and, and you know things that you wouldn't expect from say like the Iranian state or the Soviet state to to allow it's I don't know kind of interesting 
Yeah. Uh, on all of that, like on the, I think there is a myth of the film by committee, which was like essentially perpetrated by, uh, like auteurs, like, you know, I don't know, uh, Scorsese, like people like that who kind of think that, oh, instead of filming by committee, we have to give the full, like, um, artistic freedom to the director or to this uh, scriptwriter, uh, and I think it's false. Like I think it's just like a mythology of of directors, essentially the directors' union, the directors' guild, and it's not actually done like that ever. It's never been done like that, and it's always been like this collaborative process. And the reason why it fails is the reason why every film fails is that like it's not because oh the decision making is moved towards the Disney executives, it's because I think the, the like Star Wars, like the Last Jedi stuff, is a good example of what happened. Is that they actually went along with the idea of like, oh, we just need to find a guy, find some moron, to who's like a, a, a an auteur, who's a director with a vision, and we'll give him Star Wars. He'll just get to make a Star Wars however he wants. You'll get to like a almost absolute freedom over like the particular you know events in this movie, and we'll see how it goes. And they gave it to Ryan Johnson to do, who basically, he got, he got like, I think, full freedom as to, like, the canon or whatever. And if you watch that movie, like, I think it's it's very unsuccessful. It's, like, barely a movie and um, just as bad as every other Star Wars movie. To me, it's, like, a very convincing demonstration of what went wrong. It's, like, it's not actually about, like, distribution of decision making. It's about aesthetic standards and it's about, like, you can't make a good Star Wars movie. Um or at least that's for me. Like, it's just, just nothing that you can do. Um, but I also think, like, what Tom said about, like, the Soviet system is that there was actually, like, both, I think. There was, on one hand, I think a very paint-by-numbers, you know, people want to see a war movie in yeah, the Soviet cinema. Th- that's true. And that was, like, and people want to see, like, a shitty comedy in the Soviet cinema, which today, I think, uh, uh, I don't know. People who start learning about Russian culture... They get like the very entry level like animation and very entry level kind of comedies, and they think like, oh yeah, this is Russian culture. This is what Russians must like. But all this stuff is so like it's so on the surface. It's like if someone like watched, I don't know, um, in America. I can't even think of something like if you watched like Disney cartoons from the '30s or something, and were like, oh yeah, all Americans wear blackface and laugh at that every day. Uh, which would be well which, trump 2020 boys yeah, that's right uh, it would be funny if that was actually true but like uh no like like you don't like have like tom and jerry like cartoons and references on, on the top tip of your tongue and that's not your aesthetic universe that's not what you like want to see every day but like on the other hand i think in, in the soviet cinema there was this other like dimension of like we're gonna cultivate artists that will be representing us at this higher stage, which is what happened in Iran, is that they had the cinema for the everyone, and then they had a cinema for festivals. And this is what happened in Korea, is they had the cinema for everyone, which is shitty, fucking most degraded culture probably in the history of the world, the most commercialized, just awful television and uh, pop culture. And then they have four or five artists that make films for can and for venice and for berlin and for they have their own film festival in busan and that's like extreme bifurcation like between what we make for the cattle in the country and what we make for you know for the festivals in america we have sundance and tiff right that's where like you know the cattle go see avengers and the good people go see miranda july or noah uh, baumbach or whatever the fuck you know like but that's the division between the cinema, like the blockbuster and the cinema of quality. Um, and in fact, there isn't like a division. It's the same thing. You see the same thing used with the same devices, but instead of uh, like the popular sentiment, you use the higher, usually borrowed from theater and literature sentiment of like, you know, uh, political engagement and character development, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's, it's basically the same. All right. So to wrap up here, before we get into questions, how about we just like shout out a movie that we think is good so that everyone can go watch something decent? I'll, sure. I'll start. I, uh, I, I like um, this is, I guess, going on the Criterion Collection pretty soon. So A Taste of Cherry by uh, Kiarostami, Iranian movie. Very good. Uh, Harvey Weinstein wanted to cut 
uh, Taste of Cherry. It was famous, like... Uh, oh, really? I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a scene at the end uh, that kind of... No spoilers, but there's a kind of like a revelation. And Is it how the, you... the very final scene? Yeah, the very kind of... I really love that. That, like... I enjoyed the movie. I was like, okay, this is fine. This is good. And then that last scene, I'm like, oh man, this like, I don't understand what, what happened, but I really, for some reason, like that, that, uh, what you were talking about earlier about film, having this different language of being like visuals and sounds. And it kind of like just works differently. Like that part of that movie is what I can, I understand what you're, what you're talking about because of that. That's the only time I've really, that film has made sense to me. Yeah, so like Weinstein thought that was too much. So for American oh, DVD geez. release, he wanted to cut it. Wow. And Weinstein was like famous for doing that. He wanted to cut... Uh, Polish cinema in America basically exists because of Miramax and because of Harvey Weinstein. So like he found like... He released, I think, big DVDs of like uh, Kislevsky, uh, Three Colors Blue, and that kind of thing. Uh, and he... For, I, think he um, I think he got Kislevsky to make a cut of Double Life of Veronique which would make a happy ending at the end. And he suppressed... There's another Kiarostami movie that Miramax released called um, Through the Olive Trees, I think. And Harvey Weinstein like personally saw to it so it doesn't get released. So there was no way to watch it anywhere in the world other than outside of like Iran. Um, yeah, in America. Wow. I guess he's a bad guy after all, man. <laughs> I mean, I like him otherwise. Personally, I think he's great as a human being. I yeah, you got to separate the artist from the work, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'll recommend uh, Pope Francis, A Man of His Word, directed by Wim Wenders. So it's a faithful documentary. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, I don't know. Just just in case. So you got you to gotta push those things just in case. Yes. Someone tricks someone into it. Does he talk? Does he, is it just like a talking documentary or is it a... He talks in it, yeah. Cool. But, you know. Is it like a talking head or does Vim do something? Yeah, it's just like a biography of him. Nice. It's okay. I don't know. I gave it four stars. Four stars. Yeah. Uh, is it in 3D? It's not in 3D, no. Vim Vendors was a big promoter of 3D. He has a movie about, like I think, uh, Caves. That was like a it was meant to be like a big, like introduction of three D movies into the art house. Oh, you're thinking of uh, what do you call? It? I don't. Was that William? Was that him or? I'm pretty know. sure. I'm pretty sure he has one, and there were like a couple others, but I think he has like one. Hold I on. think it would be appropriate to do the Pope movie in three D because of like the Holy Trinity. Yeah. Kind of like reflects the nature of the Godhead or whatever. Oh no! It might have been. It might have been hair talk. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is hair talk. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is his stuff. Oh, I like the one about like the really old uh, cave paintings and stuff. Yeah. Yep, it's a cave. I, I like that movie a lot. It's a good That's movie. A good yeah, one. yeah, it's pretty fun. Vin yeah. Vendors did a uh, one about a ballet. It's called uh, Pino. Pino. Yeah, yeah. Pino, whatever. That's yeah. the one. That was the 3D like post Avatar. They all they all like. Oh yeah, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna get into that. So there's four of those coming out in the next while, eh? the Avatar one. So. Oh yeah, I saw the schedule. It's gonna be so the schedule is until like 2029. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's it's a a long time. That's good. That's... It's good. It's good to have things to look forward to, I guess, in this life. So. That's right. <laughs> it's like you know we might be dead next year from COVID, but yeah, <laughs> Avatar you gotta movies. Got to stay alive be... to see these Avatar movies. It gives you something yeah. to live for. What is the second? What is the sequel to Avatar? I thought they ended, didn't it? I I never saw it. Uh, yeah, I think. Well, you know, they need to know the secrets of Pandora, oh, and yeah. um, you know the importance of uh, the obta- unobtainium wars or something. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. It's called Pandora, and the metal is called unobtainium. I don't know. Amazing. It's <laughs> great. That's it. Like looks M- like Mel Brooks wrote it or something. Yeah, it lo- it's like it's beyond parody. You can't parody it. Uh, yeah, the, the main guy looks like the bad guy from. Have you seen that Small Soldiers? Yeah. By uh, by, yeah Dante, and it's, it's it's he looks exactly like that. I don't know. It's impossible to parody, and I think the plot is basically uh, Small Soldiers, but the three D. All right. Did you uh, recommend a movie? So- no, I haven't. Uh, okay. I'll recommend uh, um, uh, 
Le Guy Savoir by Jean-Luc Godard, which I saw a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's or you know the translation is the gay science. Uh, it's it's a TV documentary that Godard made, but it's it's a kind of a beginning of the new Godard. So it's it's made in the '60s. I think it's it was made before May '68, but finished after, and it's very like um, stark and very. Um, there's a lot of images and sounds, but it's it still has like acting. So it's it's kind of a mix between his two periods. So it's good, and it's got uh, Jean Pierre Liod and um, uh, Julia Berto. So they're like uh, Godard regulars. Um, Really good. Good name. Cool. Cool. All right. Let's hop into the questions here. Should rapists and pedophiles be chemically castrated? Take it away, Don. (laughs) Uh, No, I don't think so because uh, um, I don't know. Police. Yeah, I don't want to give police more powers. I'm I'm fine. Like maybe we're close to the Goldilocks numbers of powers. I'm not going to. I'm not really uh, racing to. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if the social worker thing that people want to do is going to work out, but I don't want to go in the other direction and give them like, you know, being able to like execute people or, uh, you know, maim them and stuff. I don't know. That's not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not on board for that. You talk about Canada or America? No, American police can have as many powers as they want to keep oh, like Americans in line. Damn but, straight. But in Canada, no, I don't want, you know, I don't want to them to be able to i don't know yeah well i just don't see the point of chemically chemically castrating dead people you know if That's right. if you chop their heads off or whatever you're done you're done job's okay. done well, that's right. i feel like it's too sophisticated i feel like we have the technology to castrate people uh and then introducing chemicals into it i feel like it's a little bit it's kind of anesthetizes the process you gotta we've invented shears and in, what five thousand years ago i think it's and why hide the spectacle? You lose like 90% of the point of doing it. That's right. All right. So if one of or both of your accounts are banned, how will we find you? Uh, you can join the Patreon and you can find us on the <laughs> Discord. $5 a month, people. Um. Yeah. I mean, uh, if I'm banned from Twitter, it'll probably be because like, I don't know, I've been shot or something. So... <laughs> Uh, I will not get a second account just because of, uh, I don't know, if you're dead on Twitter, you're dead in real life. <laughs> I'm I'll be Twitter, around. So. You'll know no, me you'll by the, the the kitty cat. What is the kitty cat? Where is that from? That is from, and I haven't been able to find, I've, I've been looking for this again, and I it used to be on the internet, and now it's gone. So I'm glad that I grabbed it when I could. It is from the high school sketchbook of Alfred Jari, the huh. uh, the, the kind of like proto-Dadaist French artist guy. He wrote uh, Para Ubu. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was just a thing he drew in his sketchbook, and I just cropped it out and used it. It, it wasn't colorized. I did the coloring. It was just like black and white. Oh, nice. So the pink is, is your invention? Yeah. I'm um, not, on, not on Twitter, so doesn't matter to me <laughs> yeah you're kind of on and off there um let's see oh here's a follow-up on the uh, question about the japanese o- osin job okay so hey guys you finally read my question about japanese osin jobs so yeah i said no just started selling meth and now i'm writing from a cell phone in a prison cell converted to islam too thanks anyways well it all worked out after all yeah no problem there good times yeah. Uh, Tom, please do not chime in with American nonsense while Don and guests are on a Canadian topic. I'm still surprised that uh, people, I mean, you know, we had a good guest and stuff, but, you know, uh, it's, uh, yeah, most of the time people get angry at me for talking about Canada. So, yeah. Um, okay. Do you guys think that Stalin was actually reticent to provoke the United States? Sure, he backed off the Italian and Greek communist parties, but he also took Eastern Europe and supported the Korean War. I don't know. I got nothing I for know. this. I don't know. I, I feel like uh, part of it is that 
it's not necessarily the case that I think he was probably more opportunistic than he was grand theory of resisting the United States. You know, I don't know. I feel like there's probably a lot of different moments where things went one direction that he was afraid and then one another direction where he was like, okay, we've got an opportunity now in Korea or something. But I, I feel like he probably wanted to snatch as much in around his border areas as he could. But like, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think he uh, wanted a full on war anytime soon though with with the, directly or something. I think that that's yeah. I don't know. I think it's I think it is rational. Like the person is is because we joked about how uh, I I you know we made a joke about like uh, how you know Stalin wasn't crazy to give up Greece because uh, you know I don't know like there, it was very obvious that if he kept uh, if he pushed. If he kind of dialed it up to 11 right away, uh, there would have been a, you know, it's not like they could have just let it happen everywhere kind of thing or else uh, there would have been a direct confrontation and that probably would have uh, not ended well. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just sort of seeing this through the lens of like modern Russia and Putin and stuff, but I get the feeling like a lot of the moves that the Soviets made during that period were just done like on what they had to do to keep things together like it wasn't really like they had the luxury of of being like okay now we got things settled and we're gonna make some aggressive moves here what what do we want to go for now i think a lot of it was just like well, we got to take care of this we got to take care of that and then, like sometimes it involved you know i'm not justifying anything or whatever but like you know they made decisions based on what seemed to be like the uh the, the like the defensive move in a lot of cases i think yeah and i think it's also colored probably backwards from what happened under khrushchev where uh you know when you saw things like interventions in different places uh within the soviet kind of pro-soviet bloc and you saw things like you know berlin and stuff kind of spiral uh i think that like yeah i think we kind of maybe assume that that was the only possible outcome of things that would happen kind of thing, maybe. I don't know. So it's not necessarily the case that anyone post-Stalin would have continued that kind of process of consolidation or whatever. So, yeah. You got any takes on this, uh, Ed Buck? Uh, not really. I, I feel like it's a bit paradox entertainment kind of idea of like, oh... <laughs> Instead of putting all the troops in Korea, he should have put, you know, yeah. five stacks in Greece or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I think fair enough. If you pushed a little harder in Korea, we probably wouldn't have Parasite. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe he should have moved out of Greece earlier. Um, but other than that, I don't, I don't really, I don't really see a point in that. Sure. Um, we've heard a lot from Tom saying that he disagrees with the left's position on Syria and Assad. Is he in favor of some type of U.S. intervention there? And if so, why? Uh, nope. Want to elaborate on that? I, I don't know. What, what what more is there to say? Not really. Uh, I think you can say that one thing is bad and it doesn't require NATO to bomb the country in order to save it from being bombed by Russia. I, I don't know. It doesn't seem that difficult to uh, to grasp for me, but some people... Don't see it that way, I guess. I don't know. I don't really know how to engage with that kind of thinking. So you're a supporter of Al Qaeda, is what you're saying? That's what the the, uh, the moderate Al Qaeda, yeah. So, the, yeah, the know, moderate, they have, moderate. Yeah, they, the moderate they're the guess. center, the center left Al Qaeda elements. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Okay, what do you guys think about all the pedophiles that have been outed in the Super Smash gaming community? Are they connected to Jeffrey Epstein or Pizzagate? I had not heard about this. Is this like a Switch thing? Super Smash? What is this? I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know if it's on Switch. I honestly don't even know. I, I know it's like, uh, that used to be Nintendo 64, and I guess it's just been moved into other consoles that, over the years. Strange. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know if it's <laughs> that know. surprising that like adults playing a very very clearly like a child's game uh that some of them may be pedophiles i don't know if that uh that doesn't shock me doesn't shock you that people 
constantly producing children's entertainment or pedophiles. Yeah, no, that for some reason that just kind of makes some sense. I don't know. Like, that's the same thing with young adult stuff. I think it's just like people just kind of assume a little bit of risk. I feel like if you, I don't know, <laughs> especially with like Discord and stuff, you just kind of oh, you know, we'll just have a platform where people talk to children a lot about video games, things they like. And we'll see how chips fall <laughs> on the flip side. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's the other thing. It's like there are a lot of younger people at, that are in this community, I would imagine. So even if you're not into the game, you might be like, oh, that's where all the the kids are at, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, uh, I think like early years of rock and roll, it was just like, yeah, you know, like some, some 12-year-old women, 14-year-old women would just kind of disappear into a hole because of it uh we're just willing to tolerate that it's not that important i don't know well we should probably reinforce the importance of uh super smash brothers on this you know we don't you know that's not something we would give up if just oh no, to, no, you know. no it's like it's that's the value of america if you're gonna make an omelet, you gotta crack a few eggs yeah japanese pedophile <laughs> cartoons and video games that's really what we that's what we were about. Yeah. Uh, would you guys hang out with Jim Carrey's The Mask, or would he be too high energy for you? How about Jamie Kennedy? Uh, I really like Jamie Kennedy. Actually, I really like that show X that he did. That was like a knockoff on the. What was the What was the Ashton Kutcher's one? Pranked. Pranked. Yeah. yeah punked. 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 Right. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was funny. I don't know. Yeah, I, I would hang out with them. They're sure why not uh jim carrey is canadian so i already know him <laughs> we already hang out. <laughs> does he let you wear the mask oh no. no 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 it's behind glass yeah you guys just talk about the bible and stuff yeah we just talk about uh i don't know uh we just get really really high energy and <laughs> um you know talk about the mystical origin of the universe and all that so yeah you should get him on the pod. That would be a good episode. Yeah. Well, he's a friend, so I don't really like to push it, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll end with this one. Uh, what were your favorite cartoons when you were young? I'm curious uh, what, what you would say, Ed. Uh, I used to have like a VHS of cartoons that I liked. I think there were like a bunch of like like Soviet cartoons, but they were uh, from a kind of a later era. They weren't like the sort of things that you see all the time. They were a little bit odder. Uh, and then I had like a bunch of like Ninja Turtle stuff. <laughs> I think oh, I yeah, had like, yeah. uh, that, that was the time when it kind of exploded and I just could get very cheap to get like a VHS of whatever. And you could get like a bunch of that stuff. I like that. I really like Spawn. I think I remember like being able to buy that very like i was like uh, 10 or maybe younger and i got like spawn the the like the animated series and it was like the scariest weirdest thing i could see at that age and um I probably shouldn't have seen it at that age uh because it was like yeah homeless people having sex <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah and uh i didn't have the introductions the um but I had all the like all the graphic stuff, but that was like a very uh, cool thing to do. Um, I really liked uh, X Men, the animated one, whatever the cartoons, and um, uh, I don't know stuff like that. Like when it was like somewhat badass or something like that kind of thing. I thought like uh, I liked the Ninja Turtles too. Uh, but I had like the comic book, whatever, because it's all the comic book's a bit weirder, I guess, like the first one. So I was like, oh man, this is cool, or whatever. I don't know. So, yeah. And I really liked uh, the, I, don't, I can't remember what it's called, the uh, uh, Bullwinkle, what is it? Rocky and Bullwinkle show. Hmm. I watched a lot of the old ones of that, and uh, it was all the, because the, there's a little bit of Canadian content on it and stuff. And, um, I don't know. I watched a lot of the old ones because they always were on TV. And it's one of those things where like, I don't know, you know, you only had like 20 or so channels, whatever you could watch. So just, uh, it would, uh, 
you know, one of them would always be usually one of those cartoons or something like that. So I could watch them. So, yeah. Yeah. So my access to cartoons was a little bit weird. Uh, so in Finland, I used to watch Obelisk, Asterix and Obelisk all the time. Uh, I really enjoyed that. And then there's like a channel on there called, um, well, it's channel two, but they they have like a certain period of time where it's like kids shows uh, called Pikko Kakunen. And uh, that had uh, just like random little animations, like kind of like Gumby style claymation stuff. And uh, almost like the Soviet style, like kind of abstract, weird kind of things. And so I enjoyed that when I was in Finland. Uh, and then elsewhere, most of the time, the cartoons that were available were just on the AFRTS channel, which is like the the like the U.S. military's channel that they provide to you. And they they had like a one hour where they would play kid shows and stuff. Um, so what I can remember is like Animaniacs and then like classic Looney Tunes stuff. Um, I think Ren and Stimpy was on there a few times. I really liked those. Uh, once I got to India, they had Cartoon Network, so I could actually start watching like Cartoon Network. And by that time, I was a little bit older, so it was like Aqua Teen Hunger Force was just coming out. Uh, the Tick was on there. I, I thought that was pretty fun. Yeah, I think that about covers it. So, yeah. Nice. All right. Well, thanks for coming on again, Ed. Sure, yeah, it was you. fun. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this episode and you like a second episode every week, you can subscribe to the Patreon and you will have that as well as access to our Discord where you can chat with us in our community. Uh, thanks for listening and we'll catch you again next week.